Well, good morning, saints of God. Happy New Year, New Providence Baptist Church. And uh, this is week two of not meeting in person during the holiday season. And uh, just for precautionary sake, but so much, so much looking forward. Uh, next Sunday, January the 10th of meeting back together in person for worshiping and gathering together again. Miss you guys and really, really looking forward to it. But I hope everybody has had a great holiday season, a wonderful Christmas. Happy New Year. It's 2021. I can't believe it's already upon us. And so much looking forward to what uh, the Lord is going to, to do through us, through his church, in this nation, in the world, in our little community, and uh, praying and expecting big things. And uh, saints, I know that Christmas has just passed, but I love, love, love the Christmas season, and for many, many reasons, but especially in that it does provide for us a unique opportunity to proclaim to this dark world that the light of the world has come. And perhaps you haven't thought of it this way before, but the supremacy of our proclamation to this lost world is found ultimately in our worship. It is our worship of Christ and the church, in her act of worship, proclaims that the, to the world that Jesus is Lord. You know, I ran across a quote by John Piper, and I never thought of it quite this way, which is sort of typical John Piper, uh, looking at things from a very, very unique and oftentimes a very, very biblical way. And he said this. He said, Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exists because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. And when this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity. But worship abides forever. And to that, we all say, Amen. You know, as you and I walk daily with the Lord, as we worship Him and bring Him glory, we proclaim that Jesus is Lord of all. And worship should be the chief end, ultimately, of all that we do. We were made to worship. We are called to worship. It is our mandate and it is our incredible, incredible privilege that we worship the one true God. And worship is also our proclamation. We are here as God's church to make his son known. And 2020 is behind us. And I think we would all agree it has been a rough, challenging year for this groaning planet. In fact, I even heard an incredibly sad and startling fact on the radio, and that is that in one month in 2020, there were more suicides in Japan than all the COVID-related deaths combined for the past 12 months in that nation. <laughs> this world is reeling in many ways and for many reasons. The greatest reason is not because of some global virus or because of financial distress or because of lockdowns and loneliness, but it is reeling. This world is reeling because of her sin and her rebellion against her maker. Sinful man, more than anything else, needs a savior. And when God sent his son into the world, he wanted the world to know Jesus, that the Messiah had come. And in comparison to Jesus' second coming, his first coming is quiet and hushed. Yet the signs were there, as subtle as they often were, and proclamation to the world was made. In fact, the Old Testament prophecies were, were clear and they were quite specific. And yet mankind is always caught off guard, always looking, but never really seeking. 
unless, unless God himself intervenes. And so he did. And he proclaimed his plan to Mary, then Joseph, then the shepherds, and then to the Magi. I love the Magi. They seem to be so shrouded in mystery. Who are they? Where did they come from? How many were there? But really, the better question is this. Saints, how did they know? I mean, almost all Israel missed the coming of their very own Messiah. But these Gentile foreigners, they knew. Another great question, why did they come in the first place? Why? Because you see, God used them to make much of himself, to make much of his son. And he used them in a most magnificent and unusual way to proclaim that the son of God was born. The king of Israel and the king of the world has come. And like the Magi, may we continuously proclaim that Jesus Christ was born, that he is God made flesh, and that only through him can one find the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with our holy creator through Christ alone, by faith alone. So turn with me this morning on this beautiful Lord's Day to the book of Matthew. I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 2, and we're just going to look at two verses, verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And I want us to see this morning from the text really three ways that God proclaimed his son's birth through the Magi. Matthew 2, verse 1 and 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. So first, I want you to notice, God proclaimed his son's birth through the inquiry of the Magi. Now, first, who exactly are these guys? Who are the Magi? And what is their role in biblical history? Well, here's a little history of the Magi. They were a class of priestly political leaders who lived east of Israel. And they were skilled in science, and they were skilled in religion. In science, They were skilled in astrology and astronomy, and they had great knowledge in agriculture, mathematics, and history. In religion, they were strict monotheists. They only believed in one God. And they also had a sacrificial system similar to that of the Jews. They were involved in various occult practices such as sorcery, and were well known for their ability to interpret dreams. And of course, you may have guessed by now or already knew that from their name Magi, we get our word magic. And because of their vast knowledge, they became very influential and powerful advisors throughout the Medo-Persian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. In fact, they were so powerful powerful that historians tell us that no Persian was ever able to become king without mastering the scientific and religious disciplines of the Magi. Any would-be king would then be approved and crowned by the Magi. So they had great power, great influence, and great, great fame. In fact, Do you know from Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 3, who was with King Nebuchadnezzar when he attacked and conquered Judah? It was a man by the name of Nergal Sar Izer, and he was the chief of the Babylonian Magi. 
And also, did you know that one of the Jewish captives taken by Nebuchadnezzar held great sway and influence over the Magi in Babylon? And his name, of course, was Daniel. It was Daniel. And do you know why Daniel was so highly esteemed by these men? Well, you remember, the Magi were world-renowned for interpreting dreams. And King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, didn't he? And this dream greatly concerned him to the point where he couldn't sleep. And he wanted to make sense of this dream. And so who do you think he called upon to interpret it for him? The magicians the astrologers, the sorcerers, in other words, the magi. But they they could tell King Nebuchadnezzar his dream or its interpretation. Did they succeed? Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know if you can interpret a dream, well, first tell me what it was and then interpret it. Could they pull it off? They couldn't. And because they, they couldn't do what the king ordered them to do, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered the Magi for all of them to be killed. But then Daniel comes onto the scene. And he not only knew what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, but he also knew its interpretation. And he gave the glory to God. And what did Daniel do next? Well, he pleaded for the lives of the Magi. And he saved their lives. And then Nebuchadnezzar did an amazing thing. Listen to Daniel chapter 2, verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel's godly influence cannot be overstated. This man so much loved the Lord and lived in such humble obedience that he led King Nebuchadnezzar into believing in the one true God and the Messiah to come. And I sincerely have no doubt that we will one day see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. And if he could influence the king, don't you think he held great sway over the Magi? You bet he did. And again, remember... These guys loved science, and they loved religion. And I could imagine that they and Daniel had many long discussions about the God of Israel. And of course, the the other influence that Daniel and the Jews brought with them during their captivity in Babylon was the scriptures. And the Magi for certain would have poured over the Jewish scriptures in their quest for knowledge and to learn more about the one true God and the prophecies of the Messiah to come. These were world-renowned men of great power, great influence, highly regarded and highly respected. And suddenly, from out of nowhere, they show up in Jerusalem. Now, Just their presence of alone would have caused a great, great stir. And we don't know how many there were, but we know there were at least two. For the title Magi is plural. Magus is the singular. And it wouldn't be just them. They would have had many servants and helpers to assist them. They would have had camels and donkeys to carry all their food and water and shelter and supplies. So guys, when they showed up, they showed up. It was a big, big deal. Now, notice carefully what they do when they show up. Look back at the text at the end of verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2. And it says... Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? In essence, they were asking, Your Messiah has been born, Israel, where is he? 
And so it makes sense that they would go to the capital city of Israel to find the answer. But they didn't just ask this question once. The text says that they were saying, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? And the word saying in the Greek is a present participle emphasizing continual action. In other words, they asked and they asked and they asked all over Jerusalem, their entire entourage going up and down the city streets and most certainly there at the temple. So why did they have to keep asking? Because the Jews didn't know anything about their Messiah being born except for a few lower class shepherds and who's going to believe their testimony? Not one. No one, even in the capital city, knew. And they couldn't answer their question. There's no doubt the Jews were in shock. The guys, the Magi, were in shock more. For how could this be? How could the Jews not know the king of the Jews has been born? He's your Messiah, after all. And so God was at work proclaiming the birth of his son through the, these Gentile magi to the Jewish nation. They inquired. They asked. They searched. And they created an incredible stir. Next, we see that God proclaimed his son's birth through revealing a star to the Magi. Again, look back at verse 2, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Interesting thing, this star. But don't overlook how the Magi referred to this star. They didn't just say we saw a star or we saw a new star, but they said we saw his star. We saw his star in the east. Now, why would they identify it as his star? How did they make the connection with this unique star that appeared in the sky? And why did they look up in the sky, spot a new star, and head to Israel to find the baby born king of the Jews? Well, Honestly, I'm not quite sure. Now, certainly God somehow clearly communicated to them this information so that they knew what it meant and where to go. But could it be that in their study of the Jewish scriptures that the Spirit of God brought to their mind's attention an obscure prophecy? Listen to Numbers 24, 17. And here Balaam is prophesying of the future coming of Israel's king. Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. A star shall come forth from Jacob. The star here refers to Israel's coming Messiah the king of the Jews. And that's why in the King James Version, star is capitalized to emphasize this fact. And what about Jacob? Well, remember, his name was changed to Israel by the angel of the Lord. And because the Magi were stargazers, there's no doubt this verse would have leaped off the page for them to take notice. So, could it be that they read and studied this passage as well as the other messianic prophecies, and then coupled with their long astrological beliefs that when a new star appears, a king is born. The star in Numbers 24, 17 clearly refers to the king of the Jews, and this newborn king will, of course, be, be born in Israel. So now they pack their bags because he's here and they can't believe that it has happened in their lifetime. The king of the Jews 
has been born. They read those ancient prophecies. They put two and two together. They saw the star and they began to head to Israel. So also, notice that they didn't go to anoint Jesus as king as they had done so many other kings. For they said, notice what they said, that he was born king of the Jews. They knew that Jesus wasn't going to become king. They knew that he was born king. So God revealed this most unique star to the Magi to proclaim his son's birth. And it was like God was speaking the Magi's own language. So God used this star to to grip their attention. The star was new. And it was most certainly a radically different star because it moved. Even at one point, hovering directly over the house where Mary and Joseph were staying in Bethlehem. Just this past December, we we got to see something very unique in the sky, the conversion of of Jupiter and Saturn that astronomers were calling the, the Bethlehem star. This was not the Bethlehem star. The star Matthew is referring to appears, then disappears, then reappears. Stars don't do that. Stars also don't move, but this star moves and even hovered over the house where Jesus was. So this was a a miraculous source of light, like a star, but but radically different. But God used it as a sign to the Magi to grip their heart's attention, causing them to declare the birth of the Son of God. But know this, saints of God, that it's not the last time that the Lord will use a sign in the heavens to declare the coming of his Son. And we see in Matthew 24 and then in Revelation 6 that right before Jesus is returned to the earth, that a sign will appear in the sky. Jesus said, speaking of his second coming, in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 30, he says this, that immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the earth, or the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so, God proclaims his son's birth through the inquiry of the Magi, the revealing of the star to the Magi, and now notice that God proclaimed his son's birth through the worship, through the worship of these wise men. Look there at the end of verse 2. They go on to say, For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Why, why did the Magi leave everything behind to make this arduous, difficult, long journey? Why did they travel for months going hundreds of miles across desert and wilderness? Why did they search and search and search and yet never give up? Why did they expend so much time and energy and resources and efforts? One reason, and one reason only, to worship, to worship. That's why they said that was the whole point of their journey. We've come here to worship him. We've come here to worship him. Can you imagine that when they followed the star to that house in Bethlehem, that upon entering the home, they beheld him? This little toddler, Jesus, less than two years old, 
and the tears of great joy streamed down their faces, and with great awe and with great fear and inexpressible wonder, they beheld him face to face, within arms reach, there he is, God made flesh. And they fell down on their faces before this little one, and they worshipped him as God, because they knew he was God. There's God. And they worshipped him. The end of their journey marked the beginning of their journey. Worship. Because of their endless thirst to worship the Lord, they followed that star and they traveled hundreds of miles for many months and they went to Jerusalem and they asked and they asked, but no one knew. Then the star reappeared and they went to Bethlehem, even though, notice, even though no one followed them. Uh, these were the magi. These were, these were the kingmakers. These were the intellectual elite and they went alone. Nobody followed them. No one. When they found them, they worshiped. And because of their great desire to worship the one true God, the proclamation that the Son of God had come traveled everywhere with those precious magi. Wherever they went, no doubt they made much of God, much of his son. And may we, saints of God, as his church, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, may we do it all as an act of worship for the glory of our great and magnificent God. And may we diligently spread the gospel as our act of worship before our most high God and King. And may we boast of him and make much of him so that others may believe and turn from their darkness and turn to the light of the world, Jesus the Christ. After darkness, light for the glory of our Most High God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, what a Glorious, most magnificent historical account. What measures of infinite grace you poured out upon these occultists, these astrologers, these astronomers, these, these men that were so intellectual, so powerful, and yet, Lord, you impressed upon them to read the scriptures, and they read, and you granted them understanding, and you saved them so that they would be on this search, on this quest, and they would sacrifice whatever it took to find this, this little toddler because they wanted to give him one thing, not all of those incredible gifts, of gold and frankincense and myrrh, but ultimately they wanted to give him what is due him, and that is worship. Worship. What a privilege and call, O oh God, to know you and to worship you as the one true God. And may our evangelism be to that end that people would be saved for the glory of God, that more would worship you upon this planet. After darkness, light. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Happy New Year, guys. Look forward to seeing you soon, church. God bless you.